In early April, he turned 80, adding one more landmark to a lifetime of achievements. Performer, composer, author, ambassador, he's done more things, met more people, won more prizes than most others. But what is he himself actually like? Judge for yourself as I introduce you to the legendary Ravi Shankar. Congratulations on your 80th birthday, Pandaji. Thank you. Now, the name Ravi Shankar must be one of the best-known names in India or the world. And yet, it's not your original name. You made it up at the age of 20. That's right. It was uh, actually a Bengali-style name, Robindra Shankar. So I wanted to sound more, you know, more Indian, more Sanskritized. So I changed it to Ravi Shankar. You were born in Benares and you spent the early years there with your mother. I gather those were days when the family didn't have a lot of money. Yeah, we were very badly off then. She even had to pawn her jewellery many times to keep things going. Yes, she did. And uh, I was the only one who accompanied her in the evening time, you know, when she would cover herself in a shawl. She didn't want to be recognised and went to some set uh, having shop who was a very good person, called her elder sister. And she would either bring a ring or a earring or a very valuable sari that she had once got present from Maharani of Jharwa. And that's how she made extra money to bring me as well as the three other brothers to bring them up. Life was a struggle in those days. Very much. You were not just the baby of the family, you were in many ways a lonely child too, weren't you? Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. How do you remember your childhood? Very alone, till of course I joined the primary school and had some friends. Till then I was very alone, lonely. Did that help in becoming a musician later on? Did that give you a certain inner strength? I don't know, but uh, there were some instruments of belonging to my elder brother Rajendra. I used to strum on them without any training look at the mirror and make faces and do a lot of acting, whatever I saw in, in theatres or silent cinemas. In a sense, you were your own company and you had to find your own enjoyment from yourself. Absolutely. Now, I gather you met your father for the first time when you were eight. Do you remember that first meeting? Very well. You see, he was always away. He was uh, mostly first in Calcutta, then in London practicing law. So he came f for the first time I saw him when I was eight and uh, he was like an Englishman, you know, immaculately dressed so well, smelling of Eau Cologne and I mean I was, I couldn't really uh, relate to him. You write in your autobiography that perhaps in your whole life you haven't spent more than a month with your father. If I add up the two days, three days or a week all together, can't be more than two or three months, that's right. You also add that as you grew older, you began to understand him as a man better, but do you hold against him the fact that he perhaps wasn't the best father? Not now, not anymore, because I have come to understand him completely. He was a loner, at the same time he was a seeker, seeker for knowledge. All, he could have made millions, but he never was interested in money. As he followed his personal whims and fancies, the family suffered. I guess so, that's what it seemed. But he, he was such a kind man, I know, that he was sending, in these, those days, two pounds here or one pound to some student there or some widow re uh, relative uh, of him. But as you say in your autobiography, not to your mother. No. Now, your world changed when you were nine, when you met your elder brother Uday Shankar for the first time and he took you to France. What was it like growing up in Paris in the 1930s? That was... I, I can't explain. I had fever all the time with the excitement. And uh, from Benares, travelling to Bombay was already a big excitement. Then with the, on the boat, those days, you know, spending, reaching Italy and by train to Paris, the whole thing was like a dream and I was so excited. Was it strange to be the only Indian boy in a French school, or were you teased because of it? Absolutely. I mean, in the 
of course, as usual, they try to, what is the word, ragging or, mm -hmm. but uh, after some time, I know, I could be very fast running, so I would, you know, hit them and run, so gradually we became friends. Through your brother, I gather you met some of the more remarkable people of the time, you met people like Gertrude Stein, you met Anesco, you met Stravinsky, Shalyapin. Name it. I mean, everyone seemed to be in Paris at that time because Paris was the almost capital, art capital of the world. And so I was so lucky, starting from Fritz Kreisler to Shalyapin to uh, Stravinsky or any famous name that you can take in music or pa Pavlova I didn't meet personally, she died just a few months after. But famous dancers, actors, writers, everyone I met within that period of almost eight years, from 10 to How much 18. of today's cosmopolitan Ravi Shankar was actually created in Paris in the 1930s? I think the basis was because at that time I was thrown into the world of music and dance, being in my brother's troupe, my brother Uday Shankar. And we had the best musicians, Timir Baran, Vishnu Das and others. So, and I was learning dancing also, my brother's style mainly at that time. He created a style which is unique, very unique, and it's very Indian because it is almost, uh, I would say, 50% Kathakali. The rest is a little of Manipur, little of Chow, little of folk dance. Do you feel everything. that you owe a lot to him? I think so. I always consider him as one of my main gurus. The strange thing, Pandaji, is that you only took up music seriously when you were as late as 18, and you then attached yourself to Ustad Alauddin Khan, who became mm -hmm. your guru. But how much of that close bond between the two of you is actually because of your mother, who in a sense said to him, look after him? Yeah, this happened uh, in uh, 30, end of 1935 actually. We were boarding the ship from Bombay and my mother had come to see us off. And she, she was recently widowed. My father had died few months earlier. So she was, you know, she loved me so much and I was also feeling very sad. On an impulse she took Baba, that is Baba allowed in hand and gave my hand like this and said, Please look after him. I may not see him again when he comes back. He has lost his own father very recently. And then, you know, Baba Allah, then he howled loudly, cut, says, Ma, 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 from today I have two sons. Ali Akbar was my only son, now Robu, that's my nickname, is my another son. And that's how it started. That's why he always loved me very much, and I had that feeling of father that I never had really, which I felt in him. He actually took over the role of a father for you Absolutely. in a real sense. Not only guru, but that was the feeling. I know that you attribute all your skills as a sitar player to the man you call Baba. Mm -hmm. But the world seems to have forgotten that you're also side by side a great composer. For instance, I believe it was at the age of 25 that you redid the music of Sare Jahan Se Achha, is that right? <coughs> That's right. The original tune that was sung mostly was a bit slow, too slow and almost sad. Like, for instance, shall I give you an example? Please do. Sare Jahan Se Achha Hindu Sata Hamara like that, you know, very slow and serene, almost little bass of Raak Kedara. And your version? And uh, then <coughs> I did the new version. They wanted it to, to be a little more in rhythm. Sare jaha se achha Hindu sata hamara hamara Sare jaha se achha and in fact, this is the version that we know today as the That's only version. The only version, yeah. Now, in fact, there were lots of musical compositions that you did. One of the first musical extravaganzas was called Melody and Rhythm. Nehru was in the audience, and I gather he paid you a unique compliment. Yeah, that was 
way back in 58 in Delhi. Um, I did it through an institution called Triveni. They helped me to produce this. Almost less than 100 people. You know, it was orchestra, choral, everything together. It was a huge production. There was one number I did which was a lullaby in Hindi. I forgot this song, so I cannot sing it to you. But it was really very slow and very sweet with soft light. And uh, it seems, we learnt afterwards, that some people who were sitting near the box where Panditji was sitting, they heard snoring and they saw Panditji was snoring, you know, he fell asleep. The music had lulled him to sleep? That, plus he was very tired, of course. So, would you believe, after the curtain came down, like in all the other items, there was tremendous clapping. In this, there was no clapping at all. And we were wondering, that's why we heard it afterwards. The people at that time, like the whole nation, loved him so much that they didn't want to clap and disturb his sleep. That what was so sweet, I think. There were also <coughs> some, what one would call, musical experiments that you did. Pieces like Swar Kakali with Yehudi Menuhin, or the two sitar concertos with Andre Previn and Zubin Mehta. In your opus, how important are they to you? They are very important because <coughs> that gave me opportunity to do many things that was inside me and I was getting the best people to work with and especially person like Yehudi Menuhin whom I respected and loved so much and... But they criticized you for it, didn't they? The press said that you were cheapening Indian traditions, commercializing. Did that hurt? Well, that's what uh, in our country mostly we pass remarks without really realizing that at that time I think it was something new and especially me being a classical musician uh, they thought I am doing something wrong. Actually, I was not playing jazz, I was not playing Bach or Beethoven on sitar. I actually composed everything in basic ragas and talas. Just the performers were not Indian. Let's take a break there, Pandaji. I want to come back in part two and talk about some of the interesting people you've met and the role they've played in your life. We'll be back in just a couple of moments. Stay with us. Welcome back. My guest is the legendary Ravi Shankar. Pandaji, let's talk about some of the interesting people you've known. For instance, in 1966, you met George Harrison and a whole new world opened up for you. How did you get to know each other? It was a chance meeting in a party. And from the very beginning, something clicked because he was so different than any other young musicians in the pop world that I have known later. You were, in a sense, attracted to each other? Yeah, because he started asking me questions about music, about philosophy, everything, and I saw him to be so curious and at the same time very sincere. And that's how it started, really. And uh, There was I, that amazing visit to Bombay which you tried to keep secret. You went to great lengths and the press found out about it. Yes, and there was such a hullabaloo after that, my God. We were in Taj. I was in a sweet teaching and then they were within the hour that it was known that he's here though he had kept moustache and tried to be very much incognito but someone recognized him anyway there were almost two three thousand boys and girls shouting George George we want to see Ravi Shankar please where is George and then it became very difficult the very next day I took him to Kashmir. At that time it was very peaceful and lovely. You've known each other for nearly 35 years. How close are you? I, I, I would say he's like my son and he really loves me, adores me and I have the same feeling. We are best of friends. He's very funny and I, I become, you know, I pun a lot. I'm not a pundit because I pun but uh, that's something which is natural with me when I'm in mood. And with whom, uh, with him it always happens, we are always joking, new jokes and funny. During the years that you were close to him, you became in a sense almost a pop idol. 
and you were part of Monterey, you were part of the Woodstock Festival. But I gather that despite the fact they catapulted you to stardom, you actually hated those events. Too much drugs, too much violence, and too much, you know, it was raining, it was all mud, and half a million of people. I was reminded of our bullocks, you see, what do you call this? Uh, water buffalo. Water buffalo, sorry. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the mud, they love to, that's how I saw everyone, you know, they were just enjoying all stoned completely. And there was, I was really sorry that I was playing there, but I, I couldn't do anything. One of the other great influences in your life, this time not from the world of music, is in fact a famous spiritual leader, Tat Baba. What role does he play? Do you remember how you met him? From my childhood, I was always interested in these yogis and people, you know. And uh, I had met few others like Mananda Mui and others. But Tat Baba came much earlier to my life at a very difficult time when I was absolutely down. Contemplating and suicide, I believe. <laughs> almost, yeah. Uh, I did that, exactly. And he walked in my house with a pretext wanting to go to bathroom or something. And that's how it started. And I found him to be so radiant, such power. <coughs> and from all the bad times I was having at that time, <coughs> everything started changing miraculously. I was getting so many programs and so many offers for jobs and everything opened up immediately. Do you think he did it? Do you think somehow his influence Well, his call it coincidence, it? but I, I do believe that. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in fate and Absolutely, I do. But I'm not a fundamentalist or a ritualist, uh, to be exact. You know, I, I feel equally when I go to a church, I love the feeling of any temple of God anywhere. But I do very much believe in God. Pandaji, let's talk a little about yourself. You write in your autobiography, and I'll quote, I've always been very attracted to women. Are you what they call in this world a romantic? I guess so, you can say that. <clears throat> because that has been always one of the very strong force in my life. In your life, and in particular, in your attitude to women and love, people have said that he's defied conventional morality. Has that been deliberate, or is that just the way things have worked out? Unfortunately, that's how it worked out. I mean, I'm not uh, just for the sake of physical thing, you know, as you said, romantic, yes. Not a rebel? Not, <laughs> no. Uh, so, whatever happened, I had to face consequence, you know. People who read your autobiography say that he's written of his two marriages, of his love affairs, with remarkable candor and honesty. Are you deliberately there telling the story as you see it? In a sense, are you putting the record straight? I tried my level best to a point by not saying many things which would hurt some people. And neither did I want to make this book a sensational book to sell. So keeping this barrier in mind, it was a difficult job, believe me. But you did want to tell the truth, as you know. As, as much as possible, yes. It was important to you to do it. Absolutely. You know, although in your book and in your conversation you're remarkably candid and frank, there was a period in the 80s when, as you yourself admit, you suddenly became very worried about what the world would say. Yeah, I went through that, this, because constantly here I always felt, you know, <clears throat> I know it might sound too high-handed if I say that, but there's so much of hypocrisy. You know, people do everything, but it is always covered, and they always criticize other people. I mean, that thing always bothered me, but it was to such an extent that I thought, let me try to be as much as possible, you know. And I didn't feel that was necessary, but I went through this period. Yeah. Did, did this period coincided when you were in love with your present wife, Sukanya, but not able to actually formally marry her? You had a daughter, Anushka, but you weren't able to admit it? Exactly. I, it was a mess 
at that time. I had so many relationships, I didn't know what to do, and uh, I, I went through a very difficult time. That Looking back on it, because it's all over, do you think you lacked courage, or do you think you came under the influence of possessive friends who gave you the wrong advice? Both. Wrong advices, <coughs> and I was t really too conscious of Lok Kya Kahenge. That's the big thing in our country, you know, Lok Kya Kahenge. You were worried that you were in love with someone 34 years younger and people would speak to exactly. wrongly. I had uh, all these, you know, hesitations till I something snapped in me and then I said, what the hell, enough is enough, and I decided. Quite right, and when you decided, I gather, you announced it to the press before you told your wife, Sukhan, it came as a surprise to her. Almost that, yeah. <laughs> so the, the playfulness remained with you right to the end. <laughs> I don't know, yeah. but uh, that's what I've sincerely fe felt, really, and I'm happy that I... There is another sentence in your autobiography which intrigues me. I want to quote it to you. It says, I tell you with utter frankness that I really could have become great if I were not such a pleasure lover and so disorganized and idle by nature. What is it that you feel that you failed to do? Well, it is again the truth, because I had so much energy and uh, I do feel that I didn't work that much on star. My whole energy was divided to so much, you know. I love to read a lot. I love to compose and, you know, do these things. Then, of course, the romantic pursuits were there. And uh, all that took so much time, which I now sometimes think maybe had I channelized more into the direction, especially when I think of music, that I would have been an even better player. Are you really telling me, Panditji, that a man the world admires today as he becomes 80 has regrets that he hasn't achieved everything he could have? Sadly, it is true. I feel that, because I know I had the potentiality to do, do very much more. And I still have. But, you know, either circumstances or the energy level does change along with the age. You, you cannot be same as you were 20 years ago. But uh, I have so much in my head and I would like to do so much uh, still. Pandiji, I wish you the very best of luck. Thank you for Thank a lovely interview. Thank you.